So for our Grace Gem of the Week, we are going to turn to Charles Simeon, who was best known as a great Bible expositor. And he wrote a magnum opus on or his his magnum opus was a 21 volume work on sermon outlines of the entire Bible. So he wrote pretty much a devotional for all 66 books of the Bible. He lived from 1759 to 1836. And he's an he was an English guy. And so he wrote a devotional on Psalm 10. And this is what we are about to cover today. He says to himself, God has forgotten. He covers his face and never sees Psalm 10, 11. Why does the wicked man revile God? Why does he say to himself, he won't call me to account? Psalm 10, 13. And he goes on to write this. Were all the lineaments of man's contempt of God to be drawn, we could scarcely ever finish the dreadful portrait. And lineament means a distinctive feature or characteristic, especially of the face. So it's like somebody who's trying to draw somebody's face. And according to uh, Mr. Simeon, he says, if we were to do that of man's contempt, the face of man's contempt for God, it would be a very ugly, ugly portrait. He goes on to write, we make light of the father's authority, the sin's sin, the son's sin atoning sacrifice, the spirit's influence in regeneration. You know, people act every day. You know, why do I need to submit to some arbitrary law that some guy in the sky who has laid out for me? I want to do my own life. I want to live the way that I want to live. And I don't care what anybody else has to say about that. The problem, And that's exactly the the attitude of somebody who's making light of the father's authority to kill and to punish sinners. As Jesus says, don't be afraid of man who can only kill your body. And then after that, they can't do anything to you. He says, fear the one who can kill both kill your body and send your soul to hell. And that's exactly why Jesus came into the world was to save us from that wrath of God in hell, the wrath of the father in hell. That It's his sin atoning sacrifice that saves sinners from that wrath that God has the authority to use to punish those who rebel against him. And then the Spirit's influence and regeneration, we forget that. We don't come to life on our own. We have to have somebody acting upon us from the outside to bring us to a saving knowledge of who Jesus is. And that is a work of the Holy Spirit. Simeon goes on to write, every office they sustain, every attribute they possess, talking about God. So God's, God's office, God's attribute. Every relation they bear to us, we disregard and dishonor. We overlook God's providence, which, again, is something that we tend to forget that God didn't just create the world and then all of a sudden he just let it go and it's just unraveling the way it's going to unravel. No, God made the world and he's actively involved in the life of every single person orchestrating things to for his own glory. As the, as the proverb says, a man's heart devises his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Proverbs 16, 4 also says the Lord has created all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. So there's no nobody in this world is acting autonomously. Nobody's just doing things completely detached from God and, and God and God's power. We are all in some form or another bringing God glory, whether we're doing good or evil, because he's actively working in our in our lives to bring about an end that he has preordained to glorify himself. And whether you like it or not, that's what's happening. And I mean, you can fight against God. Good luck. And, and luck doesn't exist. So whatever. <laughs> it's not going to happen. He goes on to write, we are unmindful of his word. We neglect his ordinances, which I think are just the Lord's Supper and baptism. Some people say there's more. But I think the Bible is clear. You don't, there's baptism, being baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit once you made a profession of faith. And then the Lord's Supper, which Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And then he goes on to write and says, and we despise his people. And these are the people that say, I love God. I love Jesus, but I don't like being around Christians. I don't like going to church. I'm, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. All of that is bunk. If you don't love, if you love God, you're going to love to be around other Christians. Yes, they're going to sin against you. Yes, they're going to sometimes be difficult to get along with. But that's part of being in the family of God is learning to forbear one another in love, as Paul wrote to uh, to the Christians in the first century. Simeon goes on to write, God's thoughts respecting the nature and malignity of sin are widely different from those which are entertained in the hearts of natural men. Men consider themselves as innocent if their outward conduct is not grossly reprehensible and what they cannot justify in their actions, they mitigate under lenient expressions. Simply to say, what's a little white lie? You know, why why does it matter if I look at a woman or look at a man a certain way? Why does it matter if, if I love this person, if I move in with them and sleep with them and we never get married? Why does it matter if I just take a little change or take some money or take some candy from the store? Why does it matter if 
I go online and download music illegally or why do, why does it matter if I sleep when I, while, while I'm supposed to be working on the clock or why does it matter if I if I if I gamble my my life savings savings away if I'm having a great time doing it it all matters uh, we because God says it matters because God is the one who's going to judge us for those actions we tend to belittle sin especially our own when because we obviously want to defend ourselves we think we're better than we actually are when the bible says nobody's good no not one everything you do is like filthy rags even the good things that we do are like filthy rags in god's eyes because they come from sin stained hands it's like taking flowers from a guy you know murdered and raped several people i mean and the guy who murdered and raped several people we're a lot closer to him morally speaking than we are to god and that's that, because that's how big the gap is between us and God. Simeon goes on to write, but God notices the very frame and dispositions of the heart. He clearly and infallibly interprets the language of men's thoughts. He declares that the wickedness of their actions proceeds from the atheism in their hearts. Even our own minds, our own thoughts, we cannot trust them. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So you can't even really understand yourself. And people say, I really don't know why I did that. Why am I thinking this? It's because we're so corrupted that even our own hearts are deceiving us on a daily basis. And we don't have that objective standard of God's word and the light of the Holy Spirit working within us to, sh to show us who we actually are in his eyes. We're going to think that we're a lot better than we actually are. We're going to think we're a lot better than others when we're actually probably worse, far worse than they are because we God looks on the heart. We just see the outward appearance. We just see the outward deeds that people are doing. We think we look at this guy. He's given a lot of money, a lot of money to charity. He's given a lot of his time and effort serving the poor and, and 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 helping them get the healing that they need physically speaking and god sees this guy who is addicted to pornography or he's he's treating people unfairly or he's abusing people or he's manipulating people behind the scenes and because we don't see it we see him as wow he's such an altruistic guy he loves these people and we just need more people like him in the world not knowing that he's a wretched sinner a wretched a wretched degener degenerate when the cameras and, and our eyes are not on him and Simeon goes on to write, quoting Psalm 14, 1, the fool says in his heart, there is no God, they are corrupt, their deeds are vile, there is no one who does good. Men evidence by their lives that they think God will not require an account of their sin. They imagine that sin may, may be indulged with impunity as God cannot see it. But let us provide an answer to Job's question in Job 9, 4, who has hardened himself against God and prospered? Not earth and hell combined can prevent the punishment of one sinner. Proverbs 11, 21 says, be sure of this. The wicked will not go unpunished. This is the warning that we all need to heed. Every single deed done in darkness will come to light. Everything, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall have to give account thereof in the day of judgment. Jesus said, there is no escape from the wrath of God. There's no escape from God's eyes. As the psalmist writes, if I go into the heavens, you are there. If I can make my bed in, in the grave, you are there. Everywhere I go, everywhere you go, everything you do, everything you think, God sees and God will bring it to account on the day of judgment. Simeon concludes here by saying no heart can conceive the terrors of final judgment. As terrible as the Bible describes hell as being eternal fire, weeping, gnashing of, of teeth, eternal conscious torment. You are in the present. You are in the presence of God and he is not. You have no love, no compassion, no grace there. It's all God's wrath being poured out on you for all of eternity. The Bible describes it as. But we still can't conceive how terrible that is. He ends by, Simeon ends by saying, who in his right mind would risk the loss of heaven and the suffering of hell? And that phrase, in his right mind, is key because without Christ, without the Holy Spirit, we are our minds are darkened, alienated from the life of God, Ephesians said. Ephesians says, so if you want to get in your right mind, if you want to be somebody who understands the terrors of hell, who understands that you are a sinner, and and deserving of the wrath of god you have to be willing to humble yourself and the only way you're able to do that is if god shines his grace upon you to do that and we all i can do is beg you and ask you to please repent of sin please realize that you are a sinner you are somebody who's on your way to hell if you have not reckoned reckoned with god and realize that you are a sinner and need to repent of sin turn away from your sin and trust in his son for salvation that is the only way of escape that's the only way you can get in your right mind and be on your way to heaven instead of ending your life in hell.